This is Sound Founder on KUTX, and today we are joined by the prolific and legendary electronic producer Amon Tobin. Since the mid-90s, he has released many projects under a slew of different aliases in addition to composing music for films and video games. He's released six new albums since the beginning of 2019 alone, uh, a mind-boggling rate of output, really. He has recently started his own label called No Mark and released an album called The World As We Know It under his Figueroa alias. Uh, we got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get into it. Where, where are you joining us from? I'm in my studio in LA. Oh, nice. So you live, you live in LA full time? I do, yeah. I've been here since about 2015. Very cool, yeah. Um, so is that, have you, you've been pretty much quarantining there and working and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones. I haven't, I, I don't get out much to begin with. So, you know, um, I've been hunkering down and, and uh, just counting my, my blessings, really. I feel like I'm, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. Yeah, it sounds like you have a lot to keep you busy. Um, uh, let's talk about uh, Figueroa. It's a very uh, kind of big departure from most of your work, which is very sample based and bass heavy, the sound that you're known for. This new album is very, a lot of acoustic guitar and vocals and um, just a totally different vibe. I want to talk to you about kind of what was your inspiration for this whole other sound and how did you get to this point? Um, well, I guess I'd been doing, um, I'd been, I'd been lost in really uh, very, very electronic music for a long time. The, the last album I'd made was uh, I Sam, which was this really sort of um, uh, very technical record and it was you know, a very sort of contrived sound, very controlled sound. And I'd spent years trying to figure out, um, trying to teach myself different, different aspects of synthesis and um, how to manipulate sound. And it was very much, it was very geared to sort of the future, the sounds of the future, um, the most kind of, um, sci-fi futuristic sounds I could come up with and uh, and I needed on some level a kind of opposite of that for a moment and and I just wanted to kind of learn about how harmonies were working and, and basic songwriting and I was in this cabin in the woods in Northern California and I was driving around listening to like Mexican folk music and and um, and I just you know I drank a lot of tequila and made a bunch of songs that I had no no real intention of putting out I, I was just kind of trying to learn you know trying to teach myself some stuff and then many years later um, now I I I sent them to Sylvia Massey I'd listened to these songs and I thought well, these are actually good songs I'd like somebody who can actually sing and who can maybe play guitar as well to perform these songs so I reached out to Sylvia and um, and I asked her if she knew anyone um, and she, you know to my surprise she got actually got really excited about it and, and whisked me off to Capitol and we recorded you know more tequila was involved and, <laughs> We recorded the songs, you know, the vocals. I mean, the the, the tracks I'd, I'd made, but yeah, she's this legendary producer and I was really lucky to have her guidance through that. So uh, to clarify, you wrote the songs just by yourself with a guitar or are there uh, your normal processes of sampling and things involved or how did you originally write the songs as compared to like what we hear on the album? Well, actually, I haven't done any sampling since the mid '90s. That was very much a sort of early mid '90s approach to music, and it was really relevant then. It was exciting and, and, and new, you know. Um, uh, since then, I I I really moved into synthesis and and uh, kind of 
trying to uh, trying to manipulate sound in different ways and, and creating sound definitely sampling was kind of irrelevant for me I'd, ta I'd taken it as far as I could go pretty much by that point um, and with regards to these tracks it's really uh, it's all MIDI programmed so I don't play guitar I can't play guitar also can't really sing so I wasn't qualified to make this record but I use what I knew how to do which is how to do it electronically so that's you know that's what I did and that's why the record's kind of odd and it's sort of flawed and and strange you know um, and I've I've always kind of had that where I don't really I don't really know how to do something properly so I do something the way I understand and it ends up being something that has its own characteristics and its own personality because of that. So what we're hearing on the album is like a sample library of acoustic tones that you played on a keyboard or how was the songwriting done? Yeah, no, there's no samples on the record. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a mixture of VSTs and synthesizers and wow. uh, um, acoustic modeling. Um, but um, now when I say sampling, I don't mean like pulled from a record or something. I just mean like, um, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I understand. mean, like you didn't actually sit down with a guitar or a guitar player. You, those sounds were built in a computer or built with gear. Yeah, I wrote I wrote them meticulously like an idiot. Some sort that, of. I mean, that's insane. I fully just listened to the whole album top to bottom and was quite sure I was listening to an acoustic guitar player. Uh, <laughs> A lot of these things, um, particularly like VSTs, you know, because a lot of people use them for things like classical arrangement, right? For, I think, like your hands, Zimmers and stuff will, will have these libraries of, of VSTs that they use. And um, so anyone has access to these incredibly um, uh, real sounds, but it's... Uh, the way they're played, it, the way you program these things, same with drums actually, with programming drums, it, it, it's all the, the, all the nuances in how you program the stuff, your actual sensitivity to what the instrument might be played like, you know, um, versus just the notes you want to hear. There's no magic button really in the end. It's not like you can just tell a computer, play me this thing, you kind of, you need to sort of get involved in in how the sounds are articulated, how they're, um, you know, how your your fingers might be positioned. So it's a it's. I kind of feel like I should have just learned fucking guitar. To <laughs> me some time. <laughs> uh, well, it sounds amazing. Like I, I mean, I've worked with. I make music out of samples, and I've worked with samples quite a bit. But even that I guess I hadn't realized how convincing acoustic guitar VSTs could be and uh, because that I mean it's really on point um, sounds really great play yeah, like they're actually not you know like I really dug deep and I was trying to find tools I could use and I couldn't find anything hmm. that worked so what you actually end up doing is is um, bending the software to your tyrannical will, and you have to sort of figure out ways of of misusing it so that it does what it is you need to do. And then that's one element of it. You have to combine it with other things as well. Like some uh, some instruments will deal with tonality really well, uh, but they'll lack any definition in transients and other software or hardware will will deal with those transients but will we'll have a sort of fake uh, um, timber or something that doesn't sound but it's a really interesting thing though because in the end I, I kind of didn't really want to make a, like a, a substitute for a guitar I was trying to make guitar parts that maybe couldn't really be played you know, and that's always been my approach, even back in the early 90s with sampling. It's, it's like the idea isn't really to have a shortcut to a sound that, you know, exists in the real world. It's to try and do something with a sound that maybe was impossible 
with the physical instrument. Um, and so, you know, as evidenced by a lot of these guitar parts, um, turns out you need more fingers than you really have to play a lot of these things. And um, we're setting a challenge out this week, actually, where I, I managed to notate the, um, the like export the MIDI as a score for, for one of the guitar parts. And we're going to see what guitar players come back with. It'll be, it'll be interesting, I think. Awesome. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit when you mentioned ISAM. Uh, I caught you on that tour in Austin, by the way, and it's one of my probably one of my top five concerts of all time. It was a completely incredible the ISAM tour. But I wanted to ask you, because earlier this year, you released uh, an album called Fight, Fight, Fight under the Two Fingers alias. Right. which is very much uh, aggressive, bass heavy. I call it, I refer to it as like sound system music. Like it's designed to be loud and move, move things with heavy subtones. And it's almost like the exact opposite to Figueroa. So I was wondering, were you working on these two albums at the same time or? Uh... Yeah. yeah, so what happened was um, years ago, I, I, I figured out that I needed to split things into lanes because I, I couldn't really play the music I was making under my own name in a club because it was too, there was too much going on uh, and music for the dance floor needs to be quite straightforward in some ways. I'm talking about the number of elements and the, the style of production. Um, and at the same time, you know, I don't, I'm not interested in just making beats. So um, instead of trying to get those things to both work in the same place, I, I split my DJ stuff, things I play when I go and I do like a little club somewhere as, as two fingers, that's the moniker for that. And then my own stuff, which I'd perform with something like ISAM, that, that will be under my own name. And what happened was in the last eight years, I developed a sort of series of other lanes. Um, and these are, um, these are ongoing projects I'm developing. They're not side projects, right? I'm kind of careful to, to, to underscore that because um, like Two Fingers, is, I've done I think three albums now as Two Fingers and I'm continuing to develop that. And it's gonna be the same with Figueroa and Only Child Tyrant and these other things that I've been working on. But it's not like I just made, you know, six albums this year and ta-da. <laughs> it's been, you know, almost a decade working on these things and trying to develop them to a point where I can put them out confidently, knowing that there's longevity in developing each one of them. Amazing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, in addition to all this other stuff you're working on, you've started a label Right. Um, you're formerly kind of known for being on Ninja Tune, which some of our listeners will know for artists like Bonobo and um, Little Dragon and stuff like that. And um, now you've branched off and started your own label. So I want to talk to you about that. What was the motivation behind that? And um, how is that? How's that going? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's not a smart thing to do to <laughs> a label in this day and age. Um, but, um, but the thing is when you have this many things going on, you know, these many different projects going on, it's kind of unfair to expect a label to make room for that. You know, it was a lovely home um, and very supportive, but I can't, take the label over and just be like I've got you know fucking six projects that you guys need to put out and so it on a practical level it it, it just made sense it, for me to do it this way and and it's kind of exciting I feel like I mean I don't understand how the music industry works I've never understood it I don't have any predictions for where it might go I just kind of feel like my own approach is it, it sort of needs um a greater degree of control 
you know, in terms of when I'm putting things out, how I'm presenting them, um, and what I really want to do, you know, uh, and the, and this kind of affords me that I'm able to do that. Um, so artistically, it was, you know, the right move uh, on a practical sense. You know, uh, we'll, wait, we'll see how that goes. So, so good though, it's been like, what, almost, well, it's been a year and a half and we're still, we're still here. So, so far, so good. So the whole label is just to release uh, your projects? Oh yeah, it's like some ego maniacal <laughs> crazy. No, what it is, is it's like a vehicle, really. It's mm -hmm. a vehicle for me to put all this stuff under one umbrella and to also define each thing separately, right? And then, I mean, the hope is that if this is a sustainable thing and I can make it work over a number of years, um, then I would start signing other people and I would start releasing other people's music. But as this is very much a testing ground, I feel like it's, you know, it'd be kind of unfair to test it out on other people. I'm, I'm going to see how it goes for my own stuff first. So um, with, I mean, obviously the pandemic going on is affecting a lot of things in the music industry. Um, so no touring and stuff right now, obviously. Has it affected your ability to get records pressed or any, has it affected the you, the way you run the label or how you're operating? Yeah, I mean, it slowed things down for sure. Um, people are having to wait longer to get their records uh, on vinyl. People are having to wait longer to get merch. You know, things are just on short supply and slow moving and I think everybody understands that you know um, certainly touring I mean like everybody else uh, I've had to to not do that which is you know that's tough on the income stream but what's really surprising is how people have stepped up on on the other side you know I was kind of I thought wow I'm screwed man I had all these dates you know for the two fingers launch all the dates kind of uh, lined up to go and do over in Europe and in the States and, and uh, that all went to shit, obviously. And I thought, well, well, I hope people buy some music and, and they did, you know, people went on Bandcamp and, and actually put their money where their mouth is. Everyone's always like, Oh man, I love music. Music's like the most important thing in my life. And then they'll just stream it on Spotify, you know? Um, but I really feel like, like people, there was a sort of, I don't know, this sense of community. I, I mean, it sounds super cheesy to say it, but that's honestly how it felt. It felt like people were making a conscious decision. Oh, I like this. I'd like to hear more of it. So I should probably throw a few dollars at it and, and perpetuate, you know, something I want to hear more of. Um, so I've been really, really impressed by that. It's been amazing. That's yeah. great. Um, well, so, I mean, you're always working, it seems, if you're putting out so many, so many projects and now running a label and everything, do you, what do you do when you're not working? What do you do um, for fun? I, I, I have a very one-dimensional existence. I'm not a well-rounded person. So I, there really isn't a lot else going on, honestly. But that's what I want. I'm really happy. I'm really happy doing this and only this for as much as the, the day allows me. Um, I'm not saying that's a, you know, the way, the way for a, for a healthy life. But I I feel good. I feel fine. Yeah. So no hobbies I can list. Unfortunately, I just make tunes. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, I think we've covered a lot of stuff and i appreciate you taking time to sit down and talk with me hey man thank you thanks for having me yeah i look forward to hearing more releases and playing more of your tracks on my radio show and uh hopefully you know when the world is a little more sane i can catch up with you next time you come through austin that'd be great man i love austin that'd be yeah, really austin, yeah. austin loves you i remember when the ISAM tour happened, it was a big deal. There was, uh, it was a big deal for me, and uh, it was just everybody 
kind of in the electronic music community here was convened there to to bear witness. It was <laughs> it was insane. Um, we're actually uh, we're streaming that that show, not the Austin one, but that ISAM show because we played it at the Sydney Opera House and they recorded it. I didn't even know they recorded it, but they're gonna um, they're gonna broadcast that this Friday. Uh, I don't know when this interview goes out. That's probably ancient history by then. But um, but it's funny how how what an impact that seems to have made. I feel very fortunate, you know, to have been part of something that people that was so memorable. Amazing. Yeah, I talked to uh, I played at Low End Theory a couple of years ago. Oh yeah, right. And I met uh, Sam XL, and he was doing the sound for that, right? Yeah, he was yeah. doing that uh, along with Sharon. Um, and for North America, we, had, we were moving around to different people in different parts of the world. But yeah, Sam, me and Sam are, are tight, man. We go back. <laughs> and yeah, we still, you know, we still talk mostly about drum and bass and, and uh, sound systems. He's a good friend. Amazing. Um, one other thing, I mean, I'm probably going to edit because we're just talking now, but um, I just wanted to tell you one other funny thing. My first introduction to you, I think, was my friend when I was probably 17. My friend lent me the Bricolage LP that he had on vinyl. And he, right. told, me, he told me it was a drum and bass record. Uh, and I had a few drum and bass singles. I was in San Antonio growing up and right. I had a few drum and bass singles and they all played at 45. Um, so I thought that your record played at 45 <laughs> and I listened to it like that for like a year. And a lot of those uh, tracks actually work really well. <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> I've done that with records too. I've done that too. And, um, that's hilarious. I, I've never, I've never played it at 45. I feel like I might now just to see what you're talking about. A bunch of the tracks, especially like in the first half of the record, actually like function pretty well as like drum and bass tracks. Amazing. That's cool. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, no, I, I remember doing that with, with singles as well, but not whole albums. That's pretty, that's spectacular. <laughs> um, <laughs> cool. Well, it's been really awesome to get to talk to you. I'm a huge fan and thanks for making time to do this. Hey, I really appreciate it too. Thanks for the support.